I'm Dr. Robert Peppercorn, and this is the Medical Explorer. As a specialist in skin cancer, cosmetic laser surgery, liposculpture, and allergies, and as host of this program, I'll take you on an exploration of the medical communities of our Northern California counties and bring you behind the scenes of medical care practices right here in our local areas. Tonight, the Medical Explorer is going to demonstrate remarkable new computer technology that allows homebound patients to communicate from their homes directly with healthcare professionals at Rideout Hospital. The new telemonitoring computer system permits patients, nurses, and doctors to see and talk to each other using new teleconferencing computer equipment. What makes this communication system even more special is that the home terminal allows the healthcare professional to actually monitor the patient's vital signs and other important data over the computer. This new system is brought to you by Fremont Rideout Home Care, and we'll meet two of their nurses later tonight. In the pharmacy corner this evening, our award-winning neighborhood pharmacist, Bob Church, will update us about the common problem of head lice. Are new products available that might make it easier to kill these unwelcome pests? Well, we hope there are, I'm sure. We'll learn the answer to this and other questions about head lice in tonight's Pharmacy Corner. Our program will be extremely timely and informative, and I hope that you'll stay with us for the next half hour. Before getting to our topics tonight, let's take a look at the latest medical news. A new combination non-surgery light treatment called photodynamic therapy has just been approved by the FDA to fight pre-skin cancers called actinic keratoses on the face and scalp. Actinic keratoses, or AKs, are common precancerous skin lesions caused by chronic sun exposure. If left untreated, AKs may develop into squamous cell cancers of the skin. The new treatment is a very unique two-step process that uses a chemical called aminolevulinic acid that's applied to the individual skin lesions. The patient is then advised to protect themselves from sun exposure until the next day. Returning to the dermatologist's office on the next day, the patient's skin will then be exposed to a special blue light that activates the chemical to destroy the precancerous growths. During treatment with the blue light, patients experience a mild stinging or burning sensation in the treated areas. In general, this reaction improves immediately after treatment and ends within 24 hours. Reddening and swelling of the AK and surrounding skin may occur. The effect is temporary and improves markedly by end of the first week and should completely heal by four weeks after treatment. Other side effects of the treatment may include some scaling, itching, or some skin color changes. 75% of the patients treated had 100% clearing of their, their pre-skin cancers by 12 weeks after this brief procedure. It's estimated the procedure will be available by mid-year 2000. It's now time for us to visit our pharmacy corner as we learn the latest up-to-date information on the world of drugs and medications from one of our area's most respected neighborhood pharmacists. Returning tonight in our pharmacy corner is our award-winning registered pharmacist, Bob Church, from the Medicine Shop Pharmacy in Marysville. Bob, tell us about the problem of head lice. It's very common, isn't it? It's very common, and you would think that after all these years of dealing with head lice that we would have the situation under control, but we don't. It seems like every year, once children get back into school, uh, the problem reoccurs, and it's really a problem that affects uh, school-aged children more than any other part of our population. Um, head lice are a, a tiny little insect with six legs and little claw feet, and uh, they're about a sixteenth of an eighth of an inch uh, long, and they're flat in appearance. You can actually see them. Yes, you can see them. 
The females have a life cycle of about 30 days. That's about their lifespan. They lay their eggs uh, at the hair shafts along the base of the neck and around the ears. It takes about uh, seven days for those eggs to hatch, and then the cycle starts again. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't have any wings, so they don't fly. They don't jump. They just crawl. And so people get them from person-to-person -person contact, Absolutely. That's, that's really, I mean, it's person-to-person -person contact, uh, children uh, sharing combs, hats, sports helmets, um, sharing uh, bedding, pillows, that type of thing. So somebody gets it first and then brings it to somebody else and brings it to somebody else. And Absolutely. And if they don't treat them, those people get a lot more on them and they start crawling to other people near them. Right. And, and it just but it's not, it's not the kind of thing where if, if I have head lice and I'm sitting next to you, you're going to get head lice because they're not going to jump from me to you and they're not going to fly. Well, that's good. We'll put a little ball here. No, just, just kidding. No, no. No, just, just, no, no and you never had them. Well, there's a lot of this. paranoia, you know, in the schools and a lot of... A lot of schools have a, a no-knit policy where they'll check the kids, and if there's eggs on the, in the shafts of the hair, they'll send them home. A lot of schools don't believe that's the correct policy because of the interruption in the education. So, I mean, that's, that's just a big controversy, and some schools attack it different. I occasionally get a call from one of the school <laughs> nurses saying, what are we going to do? And, you know, you're going to help us learn about some of those things yeah. right now. What products are available to treat head lice? Okay, mostly the products that people are going to use are products which are available without a prescription. There are shampoos, uh, which are all the same ingredient. Uh, they go by the names of Bark, A200, Pyronate, Rid, uh, Pronto. There's several brand names, but they're all the same ingredient. Then there is a cream rinse, which is a separate pesticide. Um, it's probably 15 to 30 percent less toxic to humans, um, but it probably has a better chance of killing the uh, eggs than the shampoo products do. Hmm. Now, when they lay eggs, these eggs are actually referred to as nits, and yes. they're, they're attached to the hair, so you can actually right. see these little like mm -hmm. white beads yes. that are stuck there. Do you have to remove those to cure the problem? Absolutely, and they're very, very difficult to remove because they're almost cemented to the shaft, and the only way you can really get rid of those is to go through with a very fine tooth comb and very methodically section the hair and pull those off, you know, using rubber gloves and these combs and, and really spend a, a great deal of time to do that because if the product you used didn't kill all the eggs and you just have one or two eggs left there and you don't remove it, in seven to ten days you have lice again, just guaranteed. Now, I understand by the media and reports that some of these little organisms are becoming resistant to these over-the-counter products. Is, have you heard of that happening? Yes. Uh, Harvard uh, School of Public Health recently did a study where they took two groups of, of students who had previously been infested with lice in two different sections of the country, and then they uh, conducted their experiment in Borneo, of all places, where no chemicals are used at all. The lice in Borneo were killed by our over-the-counter products that we use here. But there was a great deal of resistance to the products in this country, which would make you believe that we have a real resistance problem. But on the other hand, what comes into play there is our parents utilizing the product exactly as prescribed. Because if they aren't, it throws these results sort of off center anyway. Um, I think, yes, we are seeing some resistance to these products. However, they are still the products of choice for people who have not been infested with lice before. What about the prescription products? What, are, what else is available? Well, as you know, we used for a long time, we used uh, Lindane products, which we don't use much anymore because there was a toxic factor there, uh, especially in very young children. So that's sort of gone out of favor. Um, now, as far as prescription items, we really, the only other one would be a product called Ovid or Ovide lotion, which is a malathion product. And I haven't seen that used much, which 
I don't really understand because malathion has been proved to be a very safe product. It was taken off the market at one time. It's back on now. Maybe uh, physicians just aren't aware of it yet. I don't know, but that is an effective product. I think that's really true. We don't get it marketed to us. You know, as a dermatologist, you'd expect people to be at my door every week telling me to use it, but we Certainly. just don't. We just don't have that happening. Yes, and I have not seen a prescription for that product yet. And what what is interesting, though, they say that one might even penetrate the nits and might get in there, and you won't have to take those out of the hair, Correct. which would be interesting too. Well, Bob, as usual, this is very important, very uh, useful information. I hope our viewers will discuss their concerns about head lice with their pharmacists and doctors if they need to in the future. And often the home health, uh, home health, not home health, school nurses have a lot of education on this. And oh, absolutely. Too, and, and they're good resources for parents to Certainly. talk about, too. We look forward to you returning on future Pharmacy Corner programs. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Now, on with the Medical Explorer. I'm pleased to welcome to our Medical Explorer studio two dedicated and very hardworking professionals from Fremont Rideout Home Care and Valley Hospice who will share with us some amazing new technology that's now available in the Marysville and Yuba City areas. Welcome Nurse Lynn Taylor, Community Liaison in Education, and Nurse Susan Bivens, Director of Home Care. Thank you for coming tonight. Nice to be here. It's a pleasure having you. Lynn, you've been here many times. and. I said we we're going to change the show to the Medical Explorer with Lynn, but I'm not <laughs> sure you're quite ready to do that. I don't think I am, no. <laughs> but I appreciate you having us on. And uh, Susan, you're the Director of Home Care. Welcome, yes. too. Thank you. Can you start off by uh, telling us a little bit about this uh, telemedicine program? Well, telemedicine is a real exciting new field of medicine. Um, basically, what happens is we, a provider or a nurse, can monitor a patient uh, from a nursing station in our office um, in the patient's own home. They have a, it's a two-way monitor that we place in the patient's home, very simple to use, and it runs over a single telephone line. Um, the nurse sees the patient, and the patient sees the nurse, and they can interact as far as talking and speaking to each other. Um, it also monitors the blood pressure. We can monitor pulse. We can monitor the um, chest sounds, heart sounds. It has a little um, magnifying uh, part of it, too, where we can look at medications that the patient's taking. We can make sure that that patient is taking the right amount of insulin in their syringe so we can watch them draw it up. Let me, uh, before you go on, I want to make sure we can describe this well to our viewers. So at the hospital, you have a nurse who's mm -hmm. sitting at a computer station, mm -hmm. and then she has in, on top of her computer a little TV camera that's pointing at her. So the person at the other end, who's the patient, is home watching her, and mm -hmm. she's in her office watching the patient. That's correct. So we're doing Bill Gates technology here and Absolutely. doing uh, networking. And you know, when you see you buy your Windows 98, it's got a little thing about hooking up to the net with doing this net, yeah. net meetings. It's called net meetings. Yes. It's almost having your own little internet meeting here that you're doing. Right. And yeah. again, monitoring that patient, we, we can do a lot of different things with it, too. I mean, we can also take a snapshot of the, a patient's wound. So if, a, a, if we're trying to monitor that on a daily basis to see if it's healing or not, we can send that to the physician. So there's a lot of different areas that it can, can work with. But again, I think the most important thing, this is, this is supplementing nursing. It's not necessarily um, in, in instead of a nursing visit. So would, uh, how, how would that work? Let's say the patient has a plan with the doctor of what the care needs to be. Mm -hmm. They're at home, but they don't have easy access to come driving back and forth. Um, you have the home care nurses that are going out there. Mm -hmm. How often might they still be going out? Well, again, depending on what the plan of care is, we always develop a plan of care first. And if, it's, if the patient maybe needs more visits than actually Medicare will reimburse, then we can supplement those visits with this telemonitoring. Oh, interesting. So it really works out very well. As I was thinking about this, I was saying, gee, what about people up in the foothills or you know, Perfect. really remote areas that they don't want to drive an hour down here, an hour and a half down here each time. And so. that's really why it was developed. Uh, telemedicine is really being developed for rural areas so we can reach those rural people. Um, if they can't have transportation, we can still make those visits. It runs over a single telephone line, simple to use. It has three buttons and the nurse really prompts the patient of what to do. So you, they can, they're talking and you're seeing video all at the same Absolutely. time? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Susan, how would a patient be selected to qualify for this system? Well, one of the, the criteria that we use is being out in the rural area or a distance away that it makes it difficult for the nurse to make frequent visits. Um, so distance is involved. 
but one of the major concerns uh, that we use is uh, patients that are maybe real anxious or real concerned about their care and they're frequently calling in either to the physician or to the home health office and asking, can a nurse come? I'm, I, maybe I'm short of breath or I, I have this pain and I don't know what it's caused from and I need someone to come and see me. Um, having, being able to dial in to this type of patient makes a visit kind of a pre-visit screening. Do we really need to send a nurse out or does the patient need to come to the emergency room? Uh, Lynn, how have the, the response been from patients and doctors about this new system? I mean, I'm just amazed myself. Well, the patients that have, we've had on the system uh, really, really like it, and, and it, amazingly enough, has really the anxiety level of a person that has chronic obstruct obstructive pulmonary disease. I mean, it's just unbelievable the, the, the less anxiety they mm -hmm. have. Physicians, it's a new technology, so it's a real educational process that we're going through to make sure that they understand what the benefits are and how it works. So it's an ongoing educational thing. And again, this program is a good way of really telling the community of how, what kind of technology we have available. What vital signs and other things can you do over the telephone line like that? You can check blood pressure and things like that? Blood or? pressure, pulse. We can listen to the chest sounds. We can listen to the heart rate. Um, and it's just amazing the quality of sound that we can hear. Uh, it's unbelievable. I and we should emphasize the patient can turn it off, so you can't secretly watch them at home if they don't yes, want to be watched. Yes, and that's a real big point, <laughs> yes, because is. confidentiality is a, is a real important thing. That's what I'd heard the very beginning. Th this person, d we always call them in advance and say, you know, we'd like to make a visit, or they call us and say, you know, we're having this problem. At that point, that monitor is turned on. There's no way possible we can turn it on and look at a patient. There's not even the, it remotely possible. It's not the brave it. new world world of uh, no. observation behind the scenes <laughs> no. here. Right? That patient has that final control. They have to turn the button on themselves at their home. And they can just unplug it, it if they want At any time. Right? That's yes. correct. <laughs> they can. You emphasized before uh, that there's importance of keeping that personal contact. Mm -hmm. at, so this isn't going to take away from the personal hands-on sort of thing. No, not at all. It really helps supplement the care oh. that we're able to deliver by having a nurse go. But a lot of times it's just to kind of, as, as Lynn mentioned, the reimbursement is, has cut so much that we can't send nurses out as frequently as we did in the past. This way we can extend the care longer, but maybe every other visit can be a telemonitoring visit so that we can actually see the patient maybe over five weeks as opposed to three weeks. Excellent. So you're basically becoming more efficient in the use right. of personnel and their time by having this ability to yes. do that. Yes. Uh -huh. Now, since I'm a computer sort of fanatico and I like to buy all this equipment and I'd have this here right now if I knew where to get the software, um, uh, this must be expensive. I mean, this is probably several thousand dollars right now to have these units. Who, who's paying for all this right now? Well, it's not presently being reimbursed by Medicare or Medi-Cal. Uh, it is being reimbursed by some managed care organizations in the United States, not in our area right here. We were very, very fortunate in getting a donation from the the Paulson Family Fund, um, and we were, that allowed us to buy these monitors. Uh, we are really looking, I think Medicare and Medi-Cal are looking at trying to possibly reimburse this later on only for, for the cost effectiveness of it. So right now though, uh, people can actually have this uh, put in their home without them having to pay anything? Right. There's no charge to the patient whatsoever. And again, because of the donation from the Paulson Family Fund, we were able to provide these. They happened to come to a home care expo and see this particular piece of equipment. And they said, what a benefit to the community. So really it was a, something that they gave to us to be able to provide to the community. Well, Susan, since you've got these devices waiting there, why can't I just call up and say I want one? I mean, how do you, how do you decide who's going to get these? That must be a sort of a complicated issue, is it? Or? Well, um, it, it, there's a lot of things involved. We have to have physician order to make sure that they agree with using the thing. The patient has to be receptive of using it. You have to have the, t the right type of atmosphere where you have um, a patient that's able to push the buttons. Um, usually, they have to have a caregiver in the home because it's hard to put the blood pressure cuff on or move the stethoscope around by themselves. A caregiver, uh, can that just be like a, 
a wife, maybe, a wife, or, yes. or uh, someone yeah. there help they hire an assistant at home? Mm -hmm, it doesn't exactly. have to be a trained nurse no, or anything. No, just somebody that actually moves, uh, follows the basic steps that we'll be asking them to do. I can't convince you to put one here on my desk just for fun. No, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> just, just kidding here. No, sorry. Uh, how long um, have you been using it? I mean, uh, what, and how many patients? What's going on? Well, with we, we got the units in the last summer, about June. We had a, a time period of training staff and getting all the policies and procedures set up. And we've had all together five patients that have been on this. I think we currently have three on right now. Um, the, the patients have been very positive about this. And there are enough machines now that if people are interested, they can still get right. in touch with yes, you about it? Yes, yes. We have seven units. Oh, great. Yeah. Can you give us that phone number that they would call, or I, I don't know if they have to be involved with the home care originally or all of that, but maybe you could tell them how they can yeah. start getting information. Um, they do have to be a, a patient of the Fremont Right Out Home Care Department, uh, whether it's home infusion, hospice, or home health, because we are supplementing uh, the physician's orders with this type of care. Well, maybe just from me putting in a little marketing for you, <laughs> why not? pick Freedot, Fremont Ride Out Home Care as one option so you can get access that, to this. That's right. We're the only agency north of Sacramento that is using this type of, of uh, equipment. Sounds good so, to me. So, yes, I think it can really help. Lynn, what do you see as the future of uh, home care with telemonitoring and things like this? Well, yeah, the major goal, Dr. Peppercorn, has always been to move that patient and teach that patient to self-care. That's the major goal of home health. So we look at this as just another service, another tool to be able to have them um, participate in their own care. So uh, basically, it's another way to be cost effective yet still re remain giving quality care. So I, I look at it probably being utilized more. I look at Medicare and Medi-Cal really looking at it and trying to probably reimburse for it and um, more usage of, of telemonitoring. Thank you. I really want to thank you for being here. Unfortunately, our time's running out. Okay. So. We well, would like to thank uh, Lynn, Lynn Taylor and Susan Bivens for taking the time out of their busy schedules to being here, showing us this new, what I would consider a life-saving communication system that's now available in our community. And we look forward to having you back with us on future programs discussing new updates in home care and the hospice programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. In our routine everyday practice of dermatology, which we refer to as clinical dermatology, which is people coming in for rashes and acne and different common skin disorders, one of the most common questions that comes up is, what, what do you do about itching? Well, first of all, we should talk about the causes of itching. There are hundreds of them in dermatology. They can range from skin conditions caused by insects or by allergies. There's rare skin conditions that cause itching. But the most common cause of itching is simply dry skin. What happens is the skin does not pr produce enough oil. And when it doesn't, the skin becomes itchy. In wintertime, when you have heat on in your home, the humidity level, the water vapor in the air of the house, becomes very low. And when that happens, the water vapor in the skin evaporates. And if your skin isn't producing enough oil, the skin will become dry. That outer layer of moisture on the skin gives the skin a layer of protection. And when that protection is gone, external things start to irritate the skin. Things like soap, things like abrasive clothing, uh, children playing on carpeting, animals that may be causing a little bit of itching are all factors that will trigger itchy sort of dry skin. Now what's very interesting is the biggest villain for the skin is water. Not talking about drinking water, talking about water that you use when you take a shower or a bath. Because what water is doing is it's pulling off the natural oils from the skin. Imagine if you put your body into a dishwasher and turned on the dishwasher, how you would dry out your skin. Well, essentially, if you go into a bathtub and put bubble bath in, it's like sitting in a dishwasher and you're taking all the oils off your skin. And by doing that, you trigger irritation, which ultimately triggers the itch. So what do we tell people to do? The first thing we tell them to do is not bathe as much. You can actually become too clean. So we would suggest that instead of bathing every day for people that are itching, consider bathing your whole body every other day. You can still wash your face in private areas every day, but the whole body doesn't need to be washed with soap every day. So first remedy for itch, don't bathe as much. Bathe less. You're not gonna get dirty from one day off in between taking a bath. If you take baths, and you're itching, you might consider taking a short shower. Next, look at the soaps you're using. 
Soaps that have deodorants will cause itching more. Dial, Safeguard, Iris Spring, Caress, Lever 2000 are all soaps with a large amount of deodorant chemicals in them that will take the natural oils off the skin. So dermatologists suggest using some over-the-counter milder soaps, things like a vino bar, oilatum soap, very, very nice mild product, purpose soap, another very nice one. And Neutrogena is very nice in that they have a variety of gentle skin cleansers. So we, once you pick a mild soap, then you want to add oil back to the skin, so you take moisturizing lotions, things like Lubriderm, Eucerin, Cetaphil moisturizer. Again, Neutrogena makes moisturizers. It really doesn't matter, but a non-scented, over-the-counter moisturizer used every day will help decrease skin itching. If you try these things and nothing's working, at that point it may be good to consider going to your doctor or dermatologist to ask for a prescription medication to help itching, which might be a stronger cream or even a pill. But a lot can be done. So when you're suffering with a problem like this, try these simple things, and if you need more help, just give your doctor a call. Well, that's our program for tonight. I'd like to invite you to write to me at my dermatology, cosmetic laser surgery, and liposuction and allergy office, and everything else you can think of, in Yuba City with suggestions for areas and people that you'd like to see here on the program. I'm always interested in hearing from you, and I hope that you'll suggest to your medical doctor or other healthcare professional that you'd like to see them here with me on the Medical Explorer. As you know, we are a public service program, and I really do want to hear from you with your comments and suggestions. Please write to me here at the Advanced Skin and Allergy Medical Group at 350 Del Norte Avenue, Yuba City 95991, or you can check out our new updated web page with your computer on the internet. After you check out Fremont Rideout's page, then you can come over and say www.bestlasers.com. I'll put a link to Fremont's page so they'll be happy.